So hi everybody, my name is Chaz Ballou. Uh, I'm with a company called Aptable. And today we're gonna to be talking about the new EU general data protection regulation. And in particular, we're gonna be talking about how it affects SaaS companies. What I mean by SaaS company is a company that's buying a lot of cloud services and maybe building software in the cloud. Uh, it's not strictly speaking limited to the business model of SaaS, like recurring revenue. It's more about the operational model. Uh, of SaaS, um, <laughs> you should listen to me for the following reasons. Uh, so I'm a regulatory attorney. I practiced for a couple of years uh, in the Army in Washington, DC. Before that and after that, I was a software developer. And um, I, have a, a, I have certification from a body that uh, certifies privacy professionals, uh, in particular a specialty in Europe uh, in European data protection law. And more importantly, it probably uh, at this point helped hundreds or maybe thousands of software companies stand up and run security management and compliance programs, um, in particular with a, a product we offer called Gridiron. So I've been doing this for a while. Um, GDPR is new for everybody, but as I'll show you, GDPR is actually not new. There's a lot of things in GDPR that are not new um, and that we have actually uh, quite a bit we can learn um, from GDPR. Um, just a little bit about Aptable, we help, this is what we do, we help companies build like GDPR compliance programs and HIPAA compliance programs and we help in a couple different ways. If you're interested or want to learn more, our website's aptable.com um, and there's some other ways to learn more. If you're also interested in learning more specifically about GDPR, we have a free uh, Slack team that you can jump into and uh, ask questions. There's, we've been doing a lot of Q&A. We're writing a uh, like a, a written version of this webinar, which is uh, like the SaaS company's guide to GDPR, which is going to have a lot of the content from this webinar just in a written form and links to everything um, that we'll uh, cover. And we'll post it uh, in the Slack here. So if you want to get access to that article or be notified when that drops, you can join the Slack. And also, if you just have like follow up questions, you can jump in there. Um, so right before, you know, the last thing, before we actually get down to the details, uh, this is being recorded. We're going to uh, post it on YouTube. We'll send an email after for everyone who's registered. We'll send you an email with the recording and the slides and a transcript whenever that's done. And then during the webinar, uh, you, there's a little Q&A tool somewhere in Zoom around here. It says Q&A, if you can find the Zoom control panel. If you just click that, you can type questions in and just drop questions in as we go. Um, I'm gonna answer questions. We've got some questions that were submitted beforehand. I'm gonna answer those uh, as we're going, or uh, we'll also have a spot at the end to batch questions. I'm not gonna be looking at the Q&A tool necessarily as I'm going and as I'm talking, because there's just too much going on for me to cover all of that. Um, but I will try to get everything at the end. And if you have a question and I already answered it, I'll, I'll try to jump back and point you to where I answered that before. Um, and I'll try to answer as much as possible as I can during this webinar. That said, you know, 54 minutes here is not enough time. You can probably do a webinar like this for a week straight and we're not gonna, uh, you know, be able to cover everything that I wanna cover. Um, but I'll try to flag as many issues as I can for you and get you started on uh, the right path. So again, just flag questions and you can follow up in Slack later or you can email me. I'll give you my email at the end too. Okay, so good part, what are we gonna do? We're gonna, there are gonna be four parts to this. Um, the second and the third part are gonna take the longest. There's gonna be two brief parts. So in, in the beginning, I wanna give you an understanding of GDPR is new, but it's like I said, it's not really new. I'm gonna explain what I mean. What do I mean by that? It's not really new. A lot of the principles and concepts under GDPR actually come from uh, you know, prior European data protection law. And so understanding that a bit will help us understand how to comply with GDPR because it helps you understand the intent of the regulators and the, uh, the intent of the regulatory scheme. What was working before? Why, did, why do we need GDPR? What was broken? What needed to be fixed in the opinion of you know, the European Union? Um, we'll spend a little time talking about the structure of GDPR and the basic requirements, how it works. Again, there's a lot more than I can cover in, in full detail here, but I'll give you a feel for how I think and how Aptable thinks about um, approaching GDPR. What are the important essential concepts 
and how does it all fit together? Understanding the structure uh, really helps understanding like, okay, what do we do about it? Helps you make practical decisions. And then in the third part, we're gonna talk a bunch about these practical areas. I'm gonna talk about uh, four areas of a business, like your SaaS business, and some issues. I'm gonna do issue flagging and talking a little bit about uh, practical effects. So we'll talk about uh, marketing and sales, kind of like growth and getting and acquiring new customers and some issues that pop up in there. We'll talk about um, product engineering and design and what product teams need to know and engineering teams need to know. Uh, we'll talk about uh, customer support and like customer success. And then we'll talk about recruiting and HR and uh, you know, sort of like dealing with employees and internal uh, issues. Um, and then finally at the end, we're not gonna have enough time to get and do this. But we'll give you a, a, a brief overview of how to think up if you don't have any, like if you don't have like a governance program or a GDPR or compliance program in place and you don't really know what that means or what would that would involve, I'll give you just a, a brief rundown of how to think about like what the steps are. There's basically seven or eight steps and it could, you could have 70 steps or you could have five steps or whatever, but the point is I'll, I'll give you a framework for how to think about this stuff. So, all right, let's get down to it. A um, little bit of background on GDPR. GDPR is new, but it's not really new. I'm not going to read through every one of these, but I will tell you that there is a history for GDPR going back. It's 2018, so my math is going to be terrible, but going back 70 plus years in Europe, 70 years leading up to GDPR, and there have been two kind of um, tracks, I would, I would say, like two uh, themes that have been rolling along almost independently, but that have been merging. And GDPR is the merger of these two themes. The first is, you can see like the very first thing up here is human rights. And this idea that like humans have individuals, natural people, people who like breathe and eat, you know, have feelings and eat cheeseburgers and love dogs. <laughs> uh, those are like natural human beings as opposed to like legal people, which are like corporations and businesses and organizations. So natural human beings have rights, certain inalienable rights. And uh, Europe has been very uh, progressive and sort of vocal about putting those rights into, you know, conventions and treaties and uh, later like enforce, it's, you know, they're enforceable human rights uh, for the European Court of Human Rights, for example, in 1950, that was stood up. And so at the same time, uh, as we have Europe tracking along and being concerned about human rights, at the same time, there's been this other track where Europe has been looking for a deeper economic integration throughout Europe. And it started in the 50s when they said, okay, we're gonna regulate uh, coal and steel and we're gonna make a community of coal and steel production to agree on like how to produce coal and steel and where it should go and who can buy it and stuff like that. And specifically it was because right after World War II, coal and steel are the two things that you need to like go to war, you know, to build tanks and planes and bombs and stuff. It changed a little bit with the nuclear age, but you know the Treaty of Paris here was really about economically integrating Europe, and then later, uh, you know, there are much more bigger steps to integrate Europe together. Um, through the 70s and the 80s, you started to see the emergence of like privacy laws and laws regulating data. You saw some early uh, versions of um, uh, non-binding and then kind of binding treaties in the 80s, which became really, really important because a lot of the principles and language that pop up for GDPR are actually from uh, Convention 108 and, and, and the OECD guidelines. So in 1980 and 81, we see some of the first language that's like reused again through GDPR. And then in the 90s, we see the European Union finally established. We see the beginnings of uh, the Data Protection Directive, which is EU-wide data protection regulation. Uh, GDPR is basically like a big update to the 1995 Data Protection Directive. And then there's other, you know, developments in, in human rights. Is my mic, by the way? Test. Hello. Here. I'm not sure if my microphone is working. <laughs> you guys can hear me? Okay, thanks. I'm not kidding. If anybody, just uh, chat me. Yeah, thank you very much for this feedback. Um, for whatever levels, my mic is not showing up in the levels. So I was like terrified for a few minutes that nobody had heard any of this stuff. 
Anyways, human rights and economic integration. The EU is a massive step towards economic integration. We've seen the EU charter of fundamental rights. And so these things have been trucking along and converging. Um, and the, uh, the, the real um, sort of rebalancing that's occurring right now is what we're gonna see in a minute is rebalancing between basically companies and people, economics and people, human beings, and their ability to, you know, like, to to have the right to privacy, the, and the right to like be able to communicate uh, freely without being uh, sort of intercepted or snooped on and stuff like that. But at the same time, we want to not have, you know, twenty eight different states in Europe with twenty eight different laws. That's kind of the way things have been going with the data protection directive, and it hasn't really been working. We kind of have this like patchwork throughout Europe. And also, like, not really, your, the European Union has not been happy with the level of protection that they've been getting um, for data. So, the e, you know, the, the whole of GDPR is rebalancing um, this and changing the balance between humans and, you know, human rights and, and basically companies and corporations. GDPR is bigger than just, like, for-profit corporations. It applies to the public sector. It applies to nonprofits as well. Um, but, you know, co companies and business make up probably most of the activity here. And there's even things, we're going to talk about this several times, there's even things more specific than GDPR. So when we talk about what is, what is the general data protection regulation, what does that mean? What does it mean to be the general, as opposed to what? What's the, why not just the data protection regulation? Well, it turns out GDPR is supposed to be the baseline, and then there's more specific uh, rules for specific situations. So there's a law enforcement uh, data protection directive dealing with like how police agencies and uh, you know law enforcement agencies can deal with and collect data. And that's really important in Europe. You had like secret police for a long time, you know, under the Nazis and uh, under the under the Russians. And so th there's a lot of like sensitivity and, and importance uh, around that. So that gets its own specific set of rules. Um, there's something called the e-privacy directive, uh, which again is it, uh, these directives. A directive is a form of law in the EU where it has to be you pass a directive, and then each state has to pass their own version of it, and that kind of leads to some some weirdness. We'll talk about that later when we talk about like marketing and how how do you get consent for marketing and something called the soft opt-in rule. Um, but you know each state kind of has their own rules, and so the the regulations are passed once and they apply everywhere. The GDPR is a regulation. The e-privacy directive is going to get turned into a regulation probably sometime next year. And that covers specific scenarios like cookies, uh, sending email or any kind of like unsolicited marketing or messaging, text, push notifications even probably, stuff like that. And so GDPR applies in a lot of situations, but there are some situations where you're not allowed, I'll, I'll explain some of these in a minute here, but some situations where you're not allowed to use all of the tools that GDPR would offer you because you're in a specific situation, like sending email or something, where you want to send some, some marketing email, you can't use all of the tools available for GDPR. You have to use just the specific ones that are available to you in the e-privacy directive. So we're going to focus mostly on GDPR, and then in the practical section, we'll talk about um, sort of how it works better. But the basic, the basic idea is, as I said before, GDPR has two goals. The first goal is to protect humans and natural people and human rights. And the second is to facilitate the free movement of data, to be able to have like a nice system or a nice place, um, you know, Europe, for example, to be able to do fun things and nice things and meaningful things with data. And how do we balance between these two? This, this is what GDPR is all about. Um, it's about, it's about, you know, regulators putting a thumb on the scale and saying we're going to rebalance uh, between people. And ultimately, like I said, free movement of data affects a lot of things, um, but in particular companies and economic activity. Um, there are some really important things to understand up front. I know most of this stuff has been written about and talked about. I'm going to just cover it real quickly. Um, first question that comes up under GDPR is does GDPR even apply to you? Right, and there are two ways that GDPR can apply to you, or both of these have to be true. So the first is you have to be processing the right kind of data. Uh, you have to be, um, you know, you have to have the right kind of data before GDPR can require that you protect it. And that data is personal data that's defined in GDPR, but it basically means any identifiable data about a natural human being, and that includes anything, 
uh, that you can identify somebody with. So it could be an email address, it could be a name, it could be a birthday, it could be an IMEI device identifier from a phone, it could be a MAC address, it could be an IP address. There's a ton of stuff that could be identifiable. A lot of times companies have questions, well, what about like if I have like, you know, this user clicked on this thing during this time or this user is associated with this other user or account or organization, is that personal data? The answer is yeah. If you can identify a specific person that data is about, then that data is personal data. If that data is de-identified and it's not possible, even with another data set to re-identify that person, that's no longer personal data. That's a tricky sort of distinction. And then there's a middle sort of tier of data, uh, pseudonymized data or key data, where you can like uh, re-identify that person, but you need access to some other data source. And that's still personal data under GDPR, but it makes some, some things easier. Like it's lower risk data if you can show that, you know, that that data is breached, but the key, the, you know, the source isn't breached, um, you'll have an easier time with some of your obligations like breach reporting, for example, and you'll probably be exposed to less risk. So personal data, any kind of in identifiable data uh, is what pulls you into the material scope um, of GDPR. And the material scope doesn't make a distinction between EU citizens or in the EU or anything. It just says this applies to all personal data. And then there's, a, there's a, another limiting factor, which is the territorial scope of GDPR. And it really, this determines what kind of businesses get pulled in or what kind of organizations get pulled in and regulated under GDPR. So it, it's pretty obvious if you're what's called established in the EU. So if you have a, like some kind of business presence in the EU, you're going to be pulled in. I'm not going to talk too much about that. There is some trickiness, like if you have a PO box or a bank account, or a lawyer in like the EU, is that an establishment? And it's, it, the threshold is probably lower than you think it would be, but a lot of companies on this call are not gonna be established. You probably don't have an EU office or something, so it's not that direct. So the question is, are you doing one of two things? Are you doing what's called targeting uh, customers in the EU? And this is contained, if you wanna read this, I'll actually, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a link real quick to this site. I'll drop this in the chat as well to all attendees. This site's a pretty good um, reference for GDPR. And if you wanna read this stuff for yourself, I'll actually jump back and forth between here. Now, if you wanna read this stuff for yourself, you can read about the territorial scope and what it means to target. Um, real quick primer here, uh, GDPR is organized into 99 articles. Those are the, the actual like operative, like sections of the law that like are the actual law. And then there's all this color commentary kind of where it's guidance and sort of uh, commentary around, um, not, it's not binding, but it's informative. And these are called recitals. So if you wanna read more about like, what does it mean to offer goods and services? Uh, you can read recital 23, which talks about targeting. And th this is where the language targeting is used. And it'll explain, you know, like just having a website in a language is not enough. There has to be some kind of like, what a lot of people today call go to market motion. You have to have some kind of like, indicator that you're trying to target customers in the EU. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're trying to sell them something, you can have like, you know, Facebook trying to sign users up in the EU, it's targeting. And then the other thing is called, um, uh, aside from targeting, is, is profiling or tracking or monitoring behavior. So any kind of like analytics, anything like that. Um, and that's called profiling. You can read more about that in article 24 here. So these are these are the the two main things for a lot of your you know United States companies that will like pull you into GDPR if you're trying to go to market at all in Europe or if you're uh, you're you're uh, profiling. I see a question here. Is the seminar recorded? Yeah, it's been recorded, so you can catch you up on this later. Um, a lot of questions come up. There are a lot of questions. A lot of this can be alleviated if you decide that you're not targeting and you're definitely not profiling anybody in the EU. You might be able to avoid GDPR entirely. Um, in, in which case, that's great, go grab a coffee or something and watch the recording later. Uh, but many of you are probably on here because you probably are targeting or profiling and going to market in the EU, or at least you wanna know what would happen. So here's, here's what happens, here's what you have to do. So the way that GDPR rebalances between people and companies and rebalances between you know uh, natural rights of humans and the free flow of data is it says, if you are the right kind of organization, meaning that you're doing, you're establishing the EU, you're doing one of these things, and you're processing personal data, you have to abide by some rules of the road here. This is like, you know, uh, 
<laughs> putting up speed limits and putting, you know, dotted lines and solid lines in the middle of the road and lane control. Like this is, these are the rules of the road. Um, these are laid out in Article 5, if you want to read about these at a general level, and then they're sort of fleshed out through the rest of GDPR in other articles. But the basic idea is that before you use as a company, before you use or collect, basically collecting as a use of data, any, any data that's personal data that's regulated by GDPR, you have to do some planning and you have to you have to get organized before you start using or collecting this data. If you have this data already, you need to get organized in the next nine days before May 25th, before it goes into enforcement. Um, the good news is that uh, a lot of this stuff is stuff you should probably be doing anyways. Um, the bad news is it sometimes can conflict with existing business models and existing technology. We can talk a bit about that. But this is kind of, these things are not um, like, groundbreaking these these principles even have been around as i mentioned since basically the early 80s in european uh law and so what are these things first of all you need to have a, what's called a lawful basis like a legal reason uh, why it's permissible for you to use data and you actually have to track each use that you're making of data which is something that not a lot of companies are used to especially in well in the u.s they're used to just like, oh, give me all this data and I'm gonna collect this data and I'll stick it in a data warehouse or a data lake or data skyscraper or whatever the hell. And I'm gonna just get all this data and then we'll figure out what to do with it later because it's, it's useful, uh, but I don't know what it's useful for yet. So I'll just you know hold off and I'll answer that later. It's like, no, you can't do that anymore. You actually have to specify what you're gonna do with the data and how you're gonna use it upfront. And then you have to tell people about it and you have to make sure that that's communicated to them in a, a, in a fair way and that you collect data in a fair way. We'll talk more about that in a sec. Um, you're only, the purpose limitation piece means you're only allowed to uh, kind of use data for the purpose for which you collected it in the first place. Uh, and if you use it for other purposes, uh, there's kind of a test to see whether you can, whether those purposes are uh, compatible or not. Uh, but generally you're not allowed to use it for something totally else. So if you collect it for like your product, you're not allowed to turn around and use it for like marketing, for example. Um, you're only supposed to collect as much data as you need to fulfill the purpose. So it's kind of like the purpose, the reason why you're going to use this data drives all of the other principles. Um, you have to make sure that that data is accurate. And you have to give people rights around being able to correct or delete uh, data if it's not accurate. You're only supposed to keep personal data around as long as you need it to fulfill the purpose. Although, again, you have a lot of flexibility around defining how long you need it. You have to make sure it stays you know, unbreached and, it, you know, it has these, uh, you know, has, it stays confidential, uh, essentially, and be, you're able to protect it. And then you, you're basically responsible for being accountable for being able to show that you've done all this stuff ahead of time at any point. And on demand, if a regulator comes to you, a data protection authority uh, comes to you or, and says, show me your evidence that you're complying, you're responsible for being accountable up front for that. You can't just say, oh, yeah, we were getting around to that. You actually have to be able to produce, you know, you've evidence that you've gone through. Uh, for most companies, it's, you know, evidence that you've done a data use inventory and that you've specified all of the relevant sort of uh, parameters around usage for data, things like that. Um, so, okay, so I mentioned this before, so every t every use you want to make of data, every time you want to use data, so you want to like use data to provide your product or use data to do marketing or use uh, data because you want to hire somebody, a contractor in Europe, you want to hire like a Polish dev shop or something, or, you know, you have uh, a, an employee or a contractor in France or Germany or somewhere. Uh, how are you allowed to do that? Remember, before you collect that data and you use that data, you have to specify a valid, what they call lawful basis, lawful base, uh, bases or bases for processing. And this, uh, there are six of them, basically. If you have what are called special categories of data, I'm not going to talk about that here, but if you have any data that's like race, sex, politics, genetics, health, anything like that, um, you're going to need two lawful bases. You need one of the original six, and then you need an extra one to go with it. But the basic idea is that uh, each one of these six, um, you can have multiple lawful bases for a use of data, but everything goes back to being able to specify what the use of data is. So some ways that you are, can be allowed to use data. Number one, if you have the data subject's consent, 
if they said, yes, you can use my data for this way. But consent is really tricky. Under GDPR, there's actually a whole article here uh, around consent and what uh, Article 7 and the definitions of consent. It can, consent has to be it has to be very clear. It has to be specific. It has to be, you know, you have to be able to withdraw consent. Um, a lot of times consent is not the best basis to process data on because it's, there's a lot of rights that spring to the data subject. Um, so just saying, okay, you consent to processing um, is not super useful. And then also there, that also, even more tricky because in some situations, I mentioned this before, like with the e-privacy directive, if you're doing cookies like web tracking or sending unsolicited emails, you need consent before you do that. So even though consent is kind of not the best basis to use under GDPR, sometimes you have to use it because there's an additional law that's more specific than GDPR that makes you use it. So that comes up. Um, ideally, you, there, any one of these other ones would be easier um, than consent because less rights spring uh, to the data subject. So if, if you need to process that data strictly to perform a contract with the data subject or it's necessary to enter into a contract, you can use this uh, contract performance basis, but it's really strictly limited to just being able to provide a service. So a lot of times people are like, oh, uh, sign up for our service and we will subscribe you to our newsletter. And companies try to convince themselves that like that's strictly necessary because we have to communicate updates to you it's like uh that would be a tough one to defend that's probably not true on the other hand if it's like we need to send you security updates and awareness uh pieces that might be closer to the mark certainly um, but contract performance the the way you're going to use data needs to strictly be necessary for the performance of that contract it doesn't have to be a contract between you and the data subject it just has to exist and I should mention here that the controller of data, we're going to talk about this. Uh, we talked about it briefly, but there are two base, two uh, sort of uh, concepts under GDPR. There's a, something called the data controller, which is where when you're the data controller and you're collecting and, and deciding what data do we collect and what data do we use, you have to make sure that all of these principles are followed and you have to make sure that you know the lawful basis, you have the most work to do. There's a, a second concept, a secondary concept called being a processor, where you just like follow instructions. You don't really decide what to do with the data. You're very limited. And a lot of SaaS companies, we'll talk about this in the, in the, uh, the next section, a lot of SaaS companies are going to try to be uh, processors, but will get pulled into being a controller. Like when you're doing marketing and sales or when you're doing recruiting and HR, you probably get pulled into being a controller. Um, but if, you're, if you keep things really, really strict, you don't use a lot of data outside of strictly providing your product um, and you provide your product directly to a data subject, you might be able to rely on contract performance um, or at least show that your processing is necessary to fulfill a contract somewhere along the line with a data subject. Um, you can process data if you're subject to a legal obligation, but it can't be an obligation that you just made up, like a contract that you made up. It has to be an obligation that arises from like EU law or like GDPR itself. GDPR requires that you keep records, for example, for accountability. So if somebody comes to you and has, uh, says, delete all my data, and I want to exercise what they call the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten, um, you're allowed to like, keep the data that shows that you received their request and complied with it, because that's necessary for you to show that you complied with GDPR. That's a good example of like, where you'd be able to say, OK, we need to retain this for a legal obligation to show our compliance. What you can't do is you can't just go like sign a contract with some other company and be like, oh, now we have a legal obligation <laughs> to process this data because uh, we made it up. That, that will not fly. Um, vital interest is basically like life or death. Uh, probably not for most companies. You know, if there's like an earthquake and you need to like find people in the earthquake or something, uh, or there's like an outbreak, an epidemic or something, uh, then you can process data, uh, but it's really like, it's like life or death stuff. So probably not going to be used very often. If you're performing some kind of like public task, like you've been delegated some kind of authority by uh, like the government or an EU body, uh, you can do that. But again, most of the time you will not be operating under this. And then the final ones, so the ones that most companies are going to use are consent, contract performance, and this last one, which is called legitimate interest. Legitimate interest just basically means that it's like the, because I want to reason under GDPR. It's like, I, I'm gonna process this data because I 
want to because I feel like it's, you know, we have a legitimate interest as a business in processing this data. Um, a lot of times remember that there are some, there are some areas, especially under anytime you want to use cookies or any kind of information that's stored on a user device and pulled back later. Or if you're doing email marketing or any kind of electronic marketing, you won't be able to use legitimate interest because you're required to use consent by the e-privacy directive. But there's a ton of other stuff you're going to do as a business, like specifically uh, in the when they call this out in GDPR. This is again where the recitals are um, are good to. So if Article Six here talks about these lawful bases, and then at the bottom. They talk about uh, network and information security as an overriding legitimate interest, right? Or like other ways, things that qualify as legitimate interest. So like that's a good example. If you need to process data for security or to, to lock a network down or things like that, those are considered legitimate interests. So the reason why all this stuff matters, number one, is because every time you process data, you have to have one of these reasons identified before you collect the data if you're a data controller. Um, and the second reason is because data subjects have all these rights under GDPR, and they've had a bunch of these rights before. Again, there's not really a whole lot that's truly new about GDPR, but these rights are things like you have to give people you have transparency. You have to tell people what data you're processing about them and give them recourse to like find out. Um, you have to give them access in a lot of cases to that data. You have to correct the data if they want you to. You have to erase it in some cases, not all cases. Um, if they want to like restrict you from processing it, so they say like, you know, don't send my data to Allstate or something, um, you may have to comply with that in certain cases. If they want to move their data or if they want to stop you, just like don't send me any more emails. For example, I object, stop sending me these emails. Um, they can do that. They're also free uh, to be, so there's this, this sense of like you can't use, uh, you cannot be subject to a fully automated decision that affects your rights in Europe without some kind of like human intervention or, or process. You, even if you are subject to that, um, the data subject, like for example, if you're doing like a credit screening online, you're like, oh, I'm going to check your credit and see if you can apply, you know, if I'm going to give you a loan, you might use like a form and just process that automatically. Um, if you do that, you have to give somebody an option to have a human review it at some point. That's an example of a data subject, right? So not all of these rights, this is the important part, not all of these rights apply in every situation. So depending, this is why the lawful basis is so important, depending on the reason that you pick that you're gonna justify your processing under, some of these rights apply and some of them don't. And we can send a broader table. There's a, a really good uh, set of guidance from the UK's information Commissioner's Office, the UKICO, um, that publishes get more guidance around this stuff. But you can see here, like, it's not true that everybody gets the right to erase data and the right to be forgotten in every circumstance. Um, it's not true that everybody can object to, you know, processing, for example. It's only in certain circumstances. Um, so, again, most of the time you're going to be processing based on legitimate interest, contract performance, or consent. Uh, and not on the other ones. Um, but for example, if you're like keeping records to comply with your own GDPR compliance and you're keeping records of like your master suppression list or your, your master deletion list, that's going to fall under legal obligation. And like not, somebody can't, they don't have the right to like request that you delete your own compliance records, for example, or, you know, take those records from you and port them out. Like those rights just don't apply in those situations. So there's way more than I can cover and talk about here. And I want to move on to the really good stuff, which is talking about the practical applications. But just be aware that this is the basic framework. Anytime you process data, you have to have a reason. You have to be able to uh, give rights in certain situations uh, when those rights apply. Um, and then there's a bunch of like other legwork that you need to be able to do. So I mentioned accountability before. You need to be able to keep records and show that you're complying with GDPR. A big part of that, a big like keystone for that is being able to map out where all of your data is and how you're using data across different assets or databases or pieces of your architecture. Um, and then be able to explain, okay, for each use that we're making of data, what systems and vendors and, and uh, you know, components do we have? And uh, what is the legal basis? What rights do we need to be able to give data subjects? Um, either as a controller or what rights do we need to be able to uh, let our uh, customers as, as controllers, if we're a processor, 
to let our customers as controllers effectuate. Um, you're probably going to need some kind of public facing privacy policy or privacy statement if you don't already. You're going to need contracts in place with any vendor who you're going to need to basically stand up vendor management and be able to formally and in an organized way manage all your vendors who are going to be touching PHI. And if those, if you're in the United States and you're receiving data from the EU, from either a customer who's a data subject or a customer who's like another business in the EU, you're going to need to be able to provide some mechanism through which they can transfer that data to you in the United States. Um, this, and that's separate from the need to actually get a contract in place uh, with the, with, to be their processor. So there's two kind of provisions here. Um, what do you need contracts for? And this can be kind of tricky because a lot of times companies will put this in one contract, but you need a contract uh, with any processor uh, that you have, anybody who's processing data on your behalf, that's Article 28, like data processing agreement, you may have heard of these. But if you're, if you're hopping data, if you're moving data outside of Europe, whoever does that first hop needs to also be thinking about our, uh, chapter five here, which is transfers of personal data to third countries like outside the EU. And there are a couple different ways you can do this. I don't have enough time to go into them. Privacy Shield is a good thing to offer if you're in a United States company. It, it can explain in the GDPR Slack or something or later um, if people have questions about that. Um, but probably you're going to end up using either what they call the model clauses or Privacy Shield. And I probably recommend in most cases Privacy Shield. You're going to need to be able to offer that so that customers in the EU or data subjects in the EU can send data to you. And then once data is in the United States, you need to still make sure that you have contracts in place with all of your processors. So like Amazon Web Services and Mixpanel and Slack and whoever else is going to be storing uh, and processing data for you. You're going to need to stand up and run a whole security management program. This is kind of like the Pandora's box of uh, GDPR. It's in Article 32. And it just it has like all of these other articles are like kind of ambiguous or uh, sometimes they're very specific or sometimes they're very clear. Article 32 is just like taking into account everything <laughs> and all of your risks, ensure appropriate security. Good luck. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a lot that goes into running like a formal, you know, best practices security program. Uh, we don't have super strong guidance around what that's going to look like, but early indications are that ISO 27001 is going to be a really important standard uh, to align around for security management. So I think we're going to see a lot of companies choosing to stand up and run ISO 27001 aligned security programs and use that as sort of the, the skeleton to run a security management program for GDPR. Uh, you have to notify if you have, if you fail to uh, protect data, if you have breaches of data, you definitely have to notify the data protection authorities and you might have to notify individuals. That's again, one of these cases where if you uh, used pseudonymization and you keyed the data out or the data was encrypted, you'll definitely have to notify the DPA, but you might not have to notify the individuals because there might be no real like risk or harm to the individuals if nobody can make use of that data. Um, but that's something where you immediately, you'll lawyer up, you'll get a lawyer when you need to um, go into that situation. You might need to appoint a data protection officer. It's not totally clear um, what, there are exceptions for a lot of firms, um, but it's not clear which firms do and which firms don't. There's guidance on this. Um, basically, if you're processing any kind of like data at web scale, you're probably gonna need a data protection officer. Um, if you're if you're processing data like infrequently in small amounts, occasionally, not really, you might not need one. Um, a lot of SaaS companies are going to need one, and there's a there's a huge shortage of good ones. Um, so that's an issue today. You're going to need to tell everybody in your workforce. We'll talk about this, but you're actually going to you know there's nothing in GDPR that says specifically you need to train people, but like obviously you're listening to this webinar. There's a ton of information here. You're going to need to like be able to communicate and train people. Um, I mentioned transfers to third countries before. You also need to, if you're outside the EU, you'll need to appoint what they call an Article 27 representative, um, which right now kind of looks like a registered agent. It's not really super clear. Um, they're used in the recital. It says the agent should be liable, but it says should be, and it's in the recital, which again is not binding. And the article doesn't say that there's any liability. So a lot of uh, companies are going to offer this service and just act like, just like a registered agent. You know, if you're uh, if you have a Delaware C Corp, 
and you you have employees like I'm in Oregon right now, so like we have an employee in Oregon. We need to be registered as a foreign entity in Oregon, uh, and then we need to have a, a registered agent. It's that type of thing. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's that type of thing. A until we get more guidance that it's not that type of thing, that it's something more. Um, but until now, a lot of companies are treating it just as a registered agent. And there's there's more to this. This is just an overview. Uh, these are the big moving parts, I think. Um, a lot of questions about this. Uh, everybody has heard about that there are these potential 20 million euros, 4% of global turnover. Uh, we've heard a lot about the potential for big administrative fines. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, definitely Facebook should probably be sweating this stuff. Google is sweating this stuff. Is our smaller companies going to need to sweat it? We'll see. What are the standards going to be? We don't know yet. Um, there are two other things that should probably concern you, though. Well, one is that under Article 58, a data protection authority can just like shut you down. They have the power to just make you stop processing. There's a bunch of other stuff in Article 58, but like that's including the ability just to like pull the plug on you. Um, there's also the fact that under Article 82, data subjects can sue you for certain things and that when they sue you, even if you're just like a processor or it's not like totally your fault, there's joint liability. So any any liability that you have, you are you're responsible for 100% uh, between you and the data subject, and then you can go get indemnification from others who are jointly liable. Um, that has not really been talked about a ton, and we're going to see how the European courts enforce it. There's a lot uh, of GDPR that's actually really similar to HIPAA in a lot of ways in the United States, and we have a lot of experience with HIPAA. This is one of the big differences. HIPAA doesn't allow a patient to just go like sue you as a company, GDPR does. So we'll see how that plays out. Okay, good stuff. Um, I'm gonna flag a bunch of issues. These are things that like companies do. And, and now that you've heard about all this other stuff and, and sort of the approach to how we look at GDPR, a lot of these things will make more sense. So first we'll talk about marketing and sales teams. If you're trying to get new business and you're trying to get new customers, what do you need to know? GDPR doesn't define the term direct marketing. Um, there's a law in the, in the UK called the Data Protection Act, uh, and there's a lot of guidance. There's a really good piece of guidance about direct marketing for the UK ICO. Again, if you want links to this stuff, I'll be able to link you in the, in the Slack channel later, or if you just email me. Um, but basically, there's restrictions on what you can do when you're trying to grow and market, and two big uh, tac categories and tactics that get regulated that are even more specific than GDPR are, are web analytics. Any kind of, uh, the way that the, the relevant law right now, uh, or the, the, regular, the, the relevant piece of law is called the Data Protection, or the, sorry, the E-Privacy Directive. And that has been passed into law in every state and they have different rules a bit. But the general idea is that anytime you're gonna store and retrieve data on a client's device, like a browser, that you need to get consent to do that. You can't use legitimate interests. You can't use any of the other sort of, you know, uh, sort of loopholes there or, or legal bases um, for processing. You have to get consent. Um, right now, one of the problems, we'll talk about this on the product engineering piece, the law does not draw a difference between like first party cookies, like a cookie that you need to let people log in and log out and a third party cookie, like a, at dropping a tracking pixel or, or you know, an ad network pixel or something like that. Um, it doesn't make a difference right now. That's going to get fixed because there is a difference. There should be a difference. That'll get fixed um, probably next year when the e-privacy regulation goes into effect. Um, but for now, just be aware that if you're using web analytics, this is why you see those cookie pop-ups. So if you're, if you're decided that you're in scope for GDPR, you're probably going to end up doing like a cookie pop-up. And there's some problems with these if you want more analysis of why the cookie pop-ups are kind of not really compliant with the law, but they're pretty much what everybody does, and they're the best sort of, you know, solution right now, probably. Um, why that is the case, there's more discussion of this in the GDPR Slack. The other thing, too, is if you're sending a lot of companies, especially B2B companies, uh, rely on, like, email and direct marketing over email, like generating lists or buying lists or something, and then sending email campaigns, um, you need to be able to get consent or show that you got consent to send those emails. You can't just like build a list, scrape LinkedIn or whatever, and then just go bomb a bunch of people with emails. 
and say, oh, if you want to opt out, opt out here. Like you need to offer the opt out, but you can't send the first email without consent. So it really restricts what you're able to do in terms of direct marketing. The other thing too is if you're not, uh, if you're building a list, you have to get the consent from uh, subjects in the EU to build a list. If you're buying a list, you need to be able to show that you you made sure that the list was assembled properly. So if you, it's almost like a, a like a providence or like a, a chain of custody type requirement. You're going to need to be able to collect and retain metadata around that list, showing that the whole list was obtained with consent. So you can't just like buy a list and send emails to people and be like, oh, I didn't make this list. I don't know where it came from. Ah, that's not, you won't be able to do that. You can't do that today. You won't be able to do that in the future. So you need to make sure that however you're building uh, your audiences and your funnels and your campaigns here for uh, marketing that you've thought about, okay, where is this data coming from? Where are these leads coming from? How did we acquire that lead? And do we have the right kind of permission? Are we tracking uh, that permission? And this is also, I, I call it suppression source of truth here, but it's really like being able to track whether, uh, you know, in what systems you're able to like send people emails or who's opted in to push notifications, things like that. You're gonna want like a master source of truth for that. You can use a CRM system, you can use autopilot, you can use a bunch of pieces of technology. Ultimately, it's less important which specific piece of technology you use and much more important that it is like, becomes your actual source of truth and that you can, you can actually use it on an ongoing basis. Um, and the last thing I mentioned this before, but it's really important because this is a big change for marketing and sales teams. A lot of times marketing and sales teams don't necessarily uh, pay a lot of attention. They're just like, oh, cool, a new tool. I will sign up for it. And they just go and they plug it in or like you just go into segment. You just like click enable, enable, enable. Like, yeah, awesome. We'll try it out. I uh, can't do that anymore if you have GDPR data, personal data in scope. You have to kind of like look before you leap. Again, this is rebalancing. Like it's awesome to be able to do that as a company, but GDPR says, no, 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 hold up, wait on. You got to get a contract in place with that processor so that we know that uh, they'll protect that data too. And that's why like segment and mix panel and all these, you know, marketing and, and analytics companies are offering data protection agreements now is because uh, of this to get an agreement in place with these vendors. What that means for you as a company is you need an, a, a process in place where your marketing, your growth teams, and your sales teams know ahead of time, hey, wait, don't just don't just enable that in segment. You gotta talk to whoever's running your compliance program first, make sure we can get the right agreement and make sure that we go, you know, before we start sending them data. Because if you send them data and you don't have that agreement in place, you just breach GDPR and you probably you want to talk to a lawyer about this, but you probably have a reportable breach. You probably have you probably have to report that, and if you don't report that, man, ooh, shit, you're gonna get you know you don't want to go down that road. You really want to it like pays a lot more dividends to to get in front of this stuff. Um, okay, so product teams, that's growth and marketing. What about like as a product team? Um, we mentioned this before. The difference between being a controller and a processor is a uh, is really, really important. A lot of SaaS companies are just going to say, oh, we're just a processor. We don't do anything except process data just according to your instructions. Here's our software. Use it. Go ahead. And that's fine. If you can actually do that, that's great. Um, the guidance around this from the, I mentioned before, GDPR is replacing something called the Data Protection Directive. There's a bunch of guidance around, from official guidance around the Data Protection Directive. And a lot of that, like what's a controller, what's a processor, that guidance is still applicable under GDPR because GDPR is using the same terms and the same concepts. It's just kind of cranking up the liability and also regulating processors directly, but it didn't do before. But if you are a controller, you have a lot more obligations. You're responsible for keeping track of all of your uses of data and making sure that each one has a legal basis and making sure that you can show all of your records uh, you have to show records anyways if you're a processor, but like the records are different and more detailed around like, what are you doing with this data? What are you going to do with it? How long are you going to keep it for if you're a controller? Versus if you're a processor, it's a more limited set of obligations. So I'll just flag this. A lot of companies are like, yeah, we're a processor. We're going to be a processor. And it's like, okay, maybe, probably in a lot of cases. But if you're doing, if you're exercising any kind of like discretion or control or deciding, what to do with this data, it may not be 
clear. Um, either way, you're going to want to make decisions that allow you, either you or your customers, to facilitate the exercise of rights by the data subjects. Uh, and you're going to have to make architectural decisions. Um, one example, for example, that comes up a ton is you have, okay, your personal data in your main database, in your users table, but you may have like, you know, user IDs and, and email addresses in logs. You may be sending container logs or database logs or SSH logs or who knows, all kinds of metadata across your infrastructure. You're going to need to get in front of that and understand what is, what PII is going where in our infrastructure and then uh, make sure that you either have the right processing agreement in place with those logging providers or that you're able to like restrict and get rid of that PHI or PII across your infrastructure. Um, maybe de-identify it, pseudonymize it, uh, so that you can, you know, you don't have, you know, identifiable, identifiable data sitting directly in the logging provider. Um, logs are just one example. It's basically any kind of like leakage of PII across your infrastructure. Um, I mentioned this before in the other one, but the law doesn't draw a distinction right now between tracking and cookies for doing like sessions and login and like functionality and cookies for tracking ads and behavioral, uh, online behavioral advertising and targeting. So you're still gonna need, um, you're still gonna need some kind of like uh, consent or like in product. You can, there's different ways you can deal with this. If you, if you wanna know more about this, jump in the Slack channel. Um, but this is an issue you're gonna need to deal with it even on the product side. So even if your marketing property is separate from your product, you have like a separate web dashboard or a mobile client or something, you're still gonna need to address this with users. Um, any kind of location data that you're using, this is really popular um, today and there are a lot of sources for this data. Just be aware that like location data is also treated separately, just like cookies and email and direct marketing, location data is treated separately uh, under GDPR, under the e-privacy rules. Uh, and you have to, again, you gotta get uh, consent and you can't just be like, we're using your location data because we want to for legitimate interests because it makes the product better or something like that, like that's not gonna be. Uh, it's not going to cut it. You're going to need more explicit consent. Um, you're going to want to think about uh, how long you're retaining data and where these various systems are retaining data. So if you have like, if you're retaining logs and you have PII in your logs, how long are you going to keep those logs? Have you thought about why you need to keep them? Maybe you archive them indefinitely now. You're going to need to revisit that and really force yourself to think like, how long do we need these? And GDPR doesn't tell you how long is acceptable but this is where it comes back to that accountability piece. It does require that ahead of time you've decided how long you've written down somewhere what the appropriate data retention is supposed to be. And then later they can check if you actually did that. But it's, it's more important that you make the decision uh, up that, uh, around data retention rather than what the specific decision is. Uh, you know, a lot of times you have discretion to do that. Um, Finally, these two encryption and uh, pseudo anonymization. Um, I never pronounce that right. Pseudo non. Who knows? If only there was somebody who knew the right way to pronounce this word. Um, but encryption and pseudo anonymization um, allow you to transform data in a way where it's not immediately like usable or accessible. Um, it's still PII for purposes of reporting a breach to a data protection authority. But again, it may may make uh, breach reporting or ultimately liability under GDPR much lower. It also allows you, um, you know, some flexibility. Uh, although I, I believe for pseudonymized data, even if the data is keyed and you have a vendor who you want to send that key data to, I believe you still have to get a data protection agreement. Same with encrypted data. If you're just sending encrypted data to a vendor, you still have to get a data protection agreement in place with that vendor and go through the whole vendor management process. So these are some things, there's more on this. Uh, we actually have a separate course uh, on, on basically product design and engineering uh, for data protection and GDPR. If you want uh, more on that, let me know in the Slack channel or over email. But these are some issues to think about as a product team. Um, from a support and customer success team, so you're thinking of like, okay, expansion, revenue, upselling, cross-selling, getting our customers, finding out what makes them happy, what makes them not happy. Um, one thing that comes up often is the ability to communicate with customers who are existing customers. So you already know and we already covered the fact that if you want to track somebody or send somebody an email and they're not your customer, it's totally unsolicited. 
you need to get permission from them. You need to get consent. And then there's this whole thing around how do you manage consent and all these rights that come when you have consent. Setting that aside, um, what about in the situation where you have an existing customer or somebody who you were talking to and negotiating a sale with? Um, there's actually an exception to that under the e-privacy rule that allows you to use basically an opt-out. We call it a soft opt-in or an opt-out, where basically if somebody's in a sign-up flow, uh, and it's different in different countries. So like in the UK, it's easier to do this. If somebody just like requests a quote from you, you're allowed to basically uh, show them a, a, a checkbox and says, hey, uncheck, you know, check here if you don't want to receive emails. So by default, you're allowed to like subscribe them to some, there's rules on this. It has to be from you. It can't be from a third party. It has to be related to the product and service that they were like buying or had uh, talked to you about. It can't be for like, you know, you come to me for a mattress and I get you an offer to refinance your home or something like it can't be that kind of stuff. And there's some other rules around this, but basically it's easier to communicate with existing customers. Um, yeah, as long as you follow a process um, to notify them when they sign up or when you interact with them before that you're going to communicate with them later and you have to keep that record. Um, but it, it's a lower bar. You're allowed to default opt in. Um, the uh, other stuff, again, just like your, you, you know, your support system, Zendesk, uh, intercom, uh, any kind of messaging system that you're using, Drift, whatever, uh, if that's going to have, you know, PII in it of customers, even if it's a B2B customer and you're, you're selling to like, I don't know, some, uh, some manufacturing company in Germany and that's your customer and it's, it's a user who's a, a member of a business in Germany, that's still personal data and you know, their data in your support system, you're gonna need to deal with that. Whether your support system is like Gmail and Front or whether it's Zendesk or whatever, you're gonna need to get DPAs in place with all of those vendors, be able to track those and basically treat them as in scope for GDPR. Um, the other thing that comes up a bunch is uh, companies are like, well, uh, I, I know I can't, send an email to somebody without consent just because but what if i do like a research survey or something or what if i uh what if i you know i'm not trying to market to them but i'm, I'm trying to get uh feedback or uh, a lot of times this comes up with business intelligence tools like i want to use the data to improve our services um and that is something where like actually legitimate interest is a really good lawful basis to use because uh, you know, consent would be great, but then what do you do uh, if they opt out? Are you going to deal with that? Under legitimate interest, you can just basically give them the right to object rather than have to worry about withdrawing consent and managing consent. Um, but on the other hand, if you're doing some kind of user survey or satisfaction survey and you cross over into marketing, you're definitely going to need consent. If you're doing any kind of marketing, uh, you're going to need uh, consent. You're not going to be able to like, so, so, in the UK, they call it uh, sugging or something, sudging, I forget what it is, but it's basically uh, doing marketing under the guise of doing like research or customer satisfaction surveys or something. So you just wanna make sure that if you're doing one or the other, that you're really clear about what you're doing. And again, I don't have enough time to go into details about this, but I can talk about this more on the Slack channel. Um, the last thing too is if you're, so, so we talked about like marketing and growing leads. We talked about product. Um, the last thing is if you have any kind of like employees or contractors or anybody in the EU uh, at all uh, that's part of your workforce, you're going to need to, that, that data counts too. So anytime you process uh, data as an employer, for example, um, or a recruiting contractors or anything like that, that is data that's in scope. So a lot of companies, uh, you know, definitely thinking about their product stack, but maybe not so much about growth or support or HR, um, but they're all, they're all functions of a company that are in scope potentially if you have uh, data um, from data subjects in the EU. Um, they don't need to necessarily be citizens of the EU. They just have to be, you have to be performing some kind of activity that's subject to EU law. So like some kind of like doing business in the EU or going to market or things like that. Um, other, I can talk more about other people have questions of like, well, can I, do I have to identify e-users when they come to my website? I'll talk about that in the Q&A. But definitely for recruiting, 
Um, so for example, if you're using an ATS system, an applicant tracking system, you're going to want to make sure that you get a data protection agreement in place with that vendor or make sure that you, you don't have EU subjects um, going on there. Uh, real quick question, can you afford, avoid GDPR for recruitment in HR if you don't hire the EU? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, if, you, if your HR processes and, and recruiting processes have explicitly nothing to do with EU, uh, even if somebody like applies for a job and ends up in the EU and you know that they're from the EU, like that doesn't necessarily, that's like having a website visitor. A lot of, th this is a popular subject on uh, Hacker News. Everybody's like, is Hacker News GDPR compliant? I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Nobody knows and it's like, there's nothing, Hacker News is not doing anything specific to go to market or target people in the EU. Likewise, if you're a company, you're not gonna fall within the territorial scope of EU for HR at least, if you don't have anything to do. And if you got incidental employees or uh, you know, applicants who are applying, um, it's not totally clear. GDPR purports to regulate that, at least in terms of material scope, but it's like, what are you gonna do? You can inform them. You, ideally, you refer them to your privacy policy and say, hey, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna delete your data now. We don't do GDPR uh, for you, you can't, you can't facilitate, you know, that's for you. Um, if you, if you, assuming that you do have employees or contractors or people, you need to worry, be aware that like background checks and background screening are treated very differently in Europe than they are in the United States. In some places you may not even, you may violate national law to do a background check, so make sure you're aware of that. Um, a lot of times getting an employment contract in place with the employee, that will be your legal basis to do all your other processing. And it doesn't give you uh, a basis to do anything outside of that processing. Like, so for example, when we're talking about employee monitoring, like, you know, if you're putting antivirus or device management on people's laptops and you have the ability to like turn on like web monitoring or tracking, huge heads up, talk to a lawyer before you do that. Do not just like be aware that that could be a third rail for you. Um, that's the kind of thing where, you know, if you're saying, oh, what's the legal basis for that? Because I want to is probably not going to fly. Because I need to in our employment contract, I don't know. That may not fly either. You're definitely going to want to talk to a lawyer, at least get more information around the potential consequences. There have been companies that have been already, you know, like I said GDPR is not new. There have been companies that have been gotten in serious trouble for basically spying on employees without their consent or without letting them know. And there are ways, if you, again, if you like everything, if you deal with it up front and you put in your employment contract, all of your data on all your work devices is subject to monitoring and here's an acceptable use policy and here's training on it. Just be aware that this stuff is happening and could go on. You know, you'll have an easier time. Um, if you just like get a bright idea and flip a switch or, or worse, realize that you've been tracking a bunch of employee behavior but that you didn't mean to, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna be up to your, <laughs> I'd say your waist, but you'll probably be up to your neck. It's gonna ruin your month dealing with it is going to really be uh, inconvenient for you. So um, the same stuff, all this stuff applies to contractors as well, uh, if you're dealing with contractors. Um, if you are, uh, if you have employees uh, in EU and you're using like Slack or like Gmail, all of a sudden their personal data is going to be in your productivity software and your tooling and your internal tooling. You need to make sure that you have data protection agreements in place, even if it's like, you know, you have an ops employee on pager duty and their email is just in pager duty and pager duty pages them when you have an issue that counts because you're sending their you know their PII to pager duty so they're a vendor you need to like be able to get the agreements in place um, employees have data subject rights too um, and including the right you know to know like how long you're going to keep their data and for why you're retaining data if you're retaining it you basically have to be able to go in a lot of cases be able to explain what you're gonna do with their personnel data, like their employee files and records, and then get rid of it if you no longer need it. So the same rules that apply upfront to collecting and processing data for your product or for growing your customer base, those apply to your employees as well. You need to make sure like internally you have a list of like, here are all why we need to process data uh, because we're a controller of this data. The reasons why we need to process data, here are the systems and here are your, you know, here are your rights basically to your employees.
okay, I do not have enough time and over seven minutes over um, to go over this. Basically, how would you get started doing all of this? Um, we'll have a SaaS guide and we can do another webinar if people want. Basically, you're going to pick one person to be responsible for this and you're going to like train them and empower them. You're going to make a list of all the things you need to do, which is probably going to be based on materials that we give you or the materials that you can assemble. But stuff like, you know, identifying um, that you have to get data processing agreements in place, for example, with vendors, stuff like that. Make a list of all that stuff. You're going to have to track all of the data and the uses that you're putting that data to and be able to organize that cleanly. You can do that in an Excel sheet if you want. If you jump on the feed or Slack, I can give you a template for it. There's all kinds of other uh, software and systems um, to track this stuff. Um, but then like basically you need to get organized, get all of the things that you care about that are in scope for you for GDPR. So if it's like, again, Slack and Gmail for productivity, okay, great. If it's, you know, mixed panel and autopilot for marketing, great. If it's AWS and Heroku and whatever for product, okay, great. You just need to be able to like organize that stuff and write it down. And then from there, once you have your requirements and all of the systems that you're using and processing, you can start making a plan for like, okay, how do I map these sort of people and data and uses and technology to these requirements. It gets easier um, from there. You're also going to have to uh, do a bunch of stuff that's not specifically called out in GDPR. Article 32 is the biggest example of this, where there's a lot of stuff. I called it the Pandora's box earlier, where it's like, oh, you have to apply reasonable safeguards to protect data. It's like, oh, what are those? <laughs> well, that's where like risk analysis and being able to look at uh, especially look at like what has happened to other companies and companies like you and be like, yeah, okay, losing a laptop. I mean, maybe duh, that would be bad, but like you should probably have some controls in place to plan ahead and be like, okay, how bad would it be if we, if that happened, how likely would it be to happen? And like writing that down and being able to say, okay, these are why we're doing these controls and these are why we're not doing these other controls. Um, doing that in a formal way is good. And then telling, you're going to have to come up with, once you have all of this plan and these rules and these requirements and everything, you're going to have to tell people about it and tell everybody in your organization what they need to know to do their job. Like, for example, like your sales team needs to know, don't just like sign up for, you know, Salesforce without letting the privacy officer or the DPO, um, you know, go in and uh, the person who's governing the program be able to go in and say, hey, can we do this or not? Stuff like that. Just, you need to like spread awareness. And then finally, you're going to want to make sure that you're actually doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, and you're going to set up processes to measure and monitor those. Um, and it, again, we'll give you, uh, if anybody wants, like a, a written guide to how to do all this stuff in the context of GDPR, um, just follow along in the Slack channel uh, or email me or something. Just get in touch with me. Um, so real quick before we do Q&A, we talked a bit about how there's like not a lot new under GDPR. There are a few things that are new, but most of this stuff is actually going, goes back a while. And there's actually a bunch of guidance um, around GDPR uh, that comes from prior guidance uh, that's really helpful. If, again, if you want links to any of this stuff, um, I am more than happy. I have so many links for all of you. If you're curious to see like what, what is the guidance on controller versus processor, well, there's a white paper on that I can show you. Um, we talked about the structure of GDPR, and most importantly, probably most of your questions are like, okay, what does it actually mean for different things we need to do? Um, and really, I've just, I probably raised more questions than I've answered, but hopefully I've given you a range of uh, red flags or yellow flags or whatever markers, things to be aware of in your business to be thinking about, okay, how are we going to answer these questions um, around things like marketing, sales, products, stuff like that. Um, so, and then we talked a bit about how to do management to all this stuff, um, but that's a much bigger topic. Okay, so Q&A here. We've got some questions. Um, I'm just going to answer these questions, so I know we're going over. If you have to drop, go ahead and drop. Um, I'm recording this, and we'll send you uh, a recording later. All right, so first question. Nick uh, submitted this before we got started a few days ago. He said, can you really adjust things based on whether a user's IP address is in the EU or do you have to worry about EU residents traveling to other countries or using a VPN? Really good question. Um, the, the scope of your GDPR compliance is going to be determined by those two things before, material scope and territorial scope. So if you have, um, if you're trying to segment your user base and only apply GDPR to users who are based in the EU, you can do that, 
for sure. That sounds like um, I would probably suggest if it's possible, just deciding this is what the EU really wants is making everybody just kind of like apply GDPR to their entire business if it's possible. Um, you know, you could certainly use IP uh, blocks. That would be totally reasonable. I do not think you need to worry about uh, EU residents traveling to other countries or using a VPN or something because the, the material scope covers personally identifiable information. The territorial scope covers if you're going to market in the EU. And if an EU user just happens to be like in San Francisco or something using your product, like that's not, you can't be held sort of responsible for knowing that. Uh, but that's, there is an open question of like how much work do you have to do to know your customer? Realistically, I tell people, I'm a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. If you have questions about this, you should really talk to somebody who can give you legal advice. Um, but realistically, the, you know, the first companies up for enforcement around GDPR are going to be companies that are like going to market in the EU. Um, and we're, we'll probably get more guidance around this later, but I wouldn't worry about, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, related to liability, can any people or companies uh, troll you for non-compliance or do you actually have to piss off some EU government mad enough to go after you? Uh, yeah, this is related to what we talked about before around um, basically liability. Where did that go? Liability and enforcement. Um, TBD, I don't know. Uh, certainly people can file complaints against you. How are those complaints going to be followed up on? Who knows? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, ultimately, if they really want to go after you, they have to sue you. They have to use you know, the courts to do that. Um, so we'll see, I guess. I'm not, I think the fear of trolling is probably greater than the actual risk, but we'll see. Uh, I'm not super, super worried about it, but I'm also spending a lot of time getting ready for GDPR, so. If U.S. companies haven't cared about cookie warnings so far, should you really care about them now? <laughs> good, good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, if you are going to market and representing yourself in Europe and you fall within the territorial scope, you should certainly be thinking about this. Uh, if you're just totally determined not to have any, if you're not doing any advertising, you're not doing any, like, you know, special like go to market motion for Europe and you're just like, hey, we're a SaaS company. We have a tool. You can use it. And you have nothing to do with anything specific about Europe. I would probably, you know, talk to a, a lawyer if it makes you feel better, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be worrying about this uh, a ton right now because you're not really in scope for GDPR um, unless you're doing something that indicates that you're going to market in Europe generally. So that said, though, if you have like, Oh, it's some web page on your site that says like, hey, you know, here's how to use our site in Paris or something. You should definitely be thinking about those. Um, what kind of emails to registered users do you need consent for and which can you use legitimate interest for? Uh, in general, any kind of unsolicited uh, communication, you can't use legitimate interest for it. You have to use consent. That said, if you have emails that are necessary for functionality of somebody's account, for example, and you have like, you, it's necessary for you, for me to send you like a password reset email, it's necessary for me to send you a security alert that you need to change your password and stuff like that. You can send those. Um, you don't need consent for those. If you have a contract with the data subject, you can just use the contract performance. Um, so like purely transactional, purely functional emails that are necessary to provide your service, those would be fine. And then we talked about this before, the soft opt-in uh, and the opt-out rule, where if you want to send newsletters or, or non-necessary you know, necessary emails, uh, if they're already your customer or they're, they're a registered user, you may be able to do that on an opt-out basis. Uh, but again, you have to do some, you have to do some legwork up front to get that. And if you have a bunch of users historically who are not, uh, you don't have consent on record for, this is like why you're seeing probably a lot of, I mean, there's a whole, all of the emails that companies are sending, there's a whole discussion in the GDPR Slack about this and how it's probably kind of like off base. Um, but basically if, if you don't have a lawful basis and you want to communicate with somebody or even store their data, 
after May 25th, you're going to need to go back and get a basis. And if your only basis is consent, you're going to need to go get consent from users. Um, okay, I'm going to go through a couple more of these. There's a Q&A tool. Uh, yeah, I mentioned PHI. I assume you meant PII, correct. I, did, I meant PII. That was just a slip from years of doing HIPAA compliance as well. So I answered that live. Um, if somebody filled out a lead form on our website at some point, does that count as consent to market to them until they opt out? No, that's what I was just saying before. So unless it, under GDPR, consent has some specific requirements. And if you're wondering what those are, look in article seven here, conditions for consent. So if you don't meet these conditions, you don't have consent. So if somebody just signed up for a lead form on your website in the past, right? And with no other information, you probably don't have consent because there's specific things you need to do. You need to tell them what you're gonna do with their data, right? You need to give them the ability to withdraw that consent. So if they can't do that, you don't have consent. So it's, it's you know, that doesn't count as consent to answer that question. On the other hand, um, you know, if you collected data in the past and you had an opt out for, you know, the, the opt out for an existing customer and you, sh you gave them the ability to opt out before and you have that, you might be able to use that exception. So you wouldn't need consent. So there are, you know, it, lead forms or ways that you might have collected that data that don't require consent uh, in the past. Um, but again, if it's just a pure lead on a marketing website, you're probably not just going to be able to like send them an email again. You should probably think about either uh, contacting them. It depends. So if you want, uh, if you want, I'm not going to say your name here, but if you want more context on this, uh, hop on the Slack channel and um, this get.apptable.com, GDPR Slack, and I can t I'll be happy to tell you more about this. But basically, no, it doesn't count as consent. Um, I talked about the avoiding GDPR for HR recruitment. Um, okay, so somebody asked here, are, are Facebook custom audiences dead or has Facebook obtained consent from a subset of its users or all of its users by allowing them to use Facebook? In which case custom audiences can still be created? Uh, that is a great question for Facebook. Uh, Facebook has spent a lot of time and effort um, complying with this and I would definitely talk to Facebook first. That said, I could talk about the general case and so not the Facebook specific case, but the general case here, which is what do I do if I'm using an analytics tool or a platform or an ad platform and I wanna, you know, I'm not sure if we have consent from the users, you need to go talk to that platform and be like, do, did you, you know, what's your story around GDPR, guys? What's the deal? Can I use your platform? AdRoll, for example, is rolling out a bunch of like GDPR tools and how-to guides and marketing and stuff like that. Um, this honestly is one of the areas which we're gonna see small companies, especially ad tech companies are gonna get shaken out by this. This really consolidates the market and you see you know, news articles about people talking about like Facebook and Google. GDPR is actually gonna benefit them. This is an example of why is because it requires a lot of investment and legwork in order to be able to run an ad tech company, for example, and stay compliant with GDPR. And if you're not able to do that investment, uh, you're going to have a tough time. You're going to be exposed to a lot of risk. Um, and so this is definitely, regulation definitely creates winners and losers. Uh, and certainly, although Facebook and Google have been in the spotlight for, uh, you know, substantive ish, human rights issues and, and privacy issues, they're also going to be in the best position to actually comply with this stuff. So I'd definitely talk to them. Um, and the answer depends on whether, whether basically whether they've obtained sufficient consent and whether they can prove it or not. Um, okay, so another question here. Our product is translated into 50 plus languages <clears throat> and we let customers in EU countries buy it if they ask, but we don't advertise or spend that much time on it and it's like 5% of revenue. Sounds like we're going to market enough to fall under territorial scope correct? Yeah, tricky one, right? Uh, so it's not enough. If you look, as I mentioned before, these recitals for um, uh, Article 3, specifically Recital uh, 23, which deals with uh, targeting. I'll, dro I'll drop this link in the chat just because it's, uh, it's good enough to read. If you just have like a website that's in the language of a company or a country, like if you have a website that's in French, 
you're not necessarily regulated. It's not the same as like being in France or doing business in France. You might be in Haiti, like having a website in Spanish, like you might be in Mexico, like that's not enough to trigger GDPR. On the other hand, if you are, if you know that you're selling into EU countries already, yeah, that definitely kind of looks like you might be in scope. So tricky questions here on both fronts. Um, and again, I would advise you to talk to a lawyer uh, around this, but like, yeah, how much risk you actually have. I can't give you good, it, that would be, you know, specific advice applied to a specific situation that tells you about your liability and risk in that situation would be legal advice and I can't give you legal advice um, as I'm not your lawyer, but that's the kind of thing where it's gonna be a tough call for you because this is close, that's on the line. Uh, I think the thing that tips it for me is probably that you have, you know you have EU customers already you know, like, you know, that you've already gone to market there. And I would, you know, for now, at least be better safe than sorry. Um, okay, we're receiving two more, three more, four more. Holy cow. Um, we're receiving data protection agreements from existing customers that have identified us as a processor of personal information. Is there any reason we should not sign these, assuming we are GDPR compliant? Again, you got to talk to a lawyer about whether you're going to sign a specific contract. Um, but if assuming that you are fully GDPR compliant, uh, yeah, you should probably sign those. Um, I again, you'd have to look at the specific DPA and the specific contract to make a, a better uh, give you better advice here. And ultimately, that, that would probably be legal advice. But like in general, yeah, like if you're if you're saying that you're GDPR compliant and that you're a processor, your customers have to get processing agreements with you in order to be able to use you. And whether you draft it or they draft it or you call it a DPA or it's just in your terms of service or whatever that is, you're going to have to figure that out. Um, so, you know, the, the specific question here is, is there any reason we should not sign these assuming we're GDPR compliant? Well, you should definitely be signing something because Article 28 of GDPR requires that you do. Specifically, should you sign exactly what they give you? I, I don't know. That would depend on a specific situation, but certainly something. Okay, uh, next one. When listing all sub-processors publicly, most companies just seem to be listing the name of the company or maybe the location. And I've seen guidance that this list or table should include exactly what is shared with those sub-processors or can that info stay private in our internal data mapping? Really good question. Um, I think I know who asked this question. I'm glad uh, that you did. That's a great question. So under GDPR, there are kind of two things, uh, two areas which you might be using Remember I said you're going to want to put together that list of data uses and, and like what you're using data for, what the lawful basis is if you're a controller, what vendors you're using for each use. There are um, two areas where that comes into play. First is if you are a uh, controller, right, you have to make sure that you comply with Article 13 or Article 14, depending on whether the data is collected directly from a subject or, or indirectly, like you on a list or something. You have to be able to basically provide uh, information to people on what data you have for them. And in this case, just looking at Article 13, this lays out like basically what you probably need to make public, like put in your privacy policy. And here it says, you know, your identity and details, the contact, your contact details for your data protection officer, or I would suggest your privacy officer if you don't have one. Um, the purposes for the processing, as well as the legal basis for the processing, if you're using legitimate interest, what are those legitimate interests? And then this says the recipients or category recipients uh, for personal data. And here, uh, this goes to your question, which is like, if most companies are listing just the name of the company, that it should include what data. It doesn't exactly say that you need to share what data is shared exactly with which uh, companies, but like it's definitely a good idea. I'll show you to make this a bit more concrete. Let's look at um, Slack and we'll look at PayPal as two examples. So Slack's approach to this has been um, basically that we are going to, where's their subprocessor? It's not here, where is it? There's a page on Slack where basically they go through, if anybody has a link, feel free to drop it to me. They basically go through and they say, here are our sub-processors. GitHub has one. Um, 
or is it? I feel like mixed panel might have one. A lot of companies have this stuff, um, but they don't necessarily. They they just say like, oh yeah, we're using, uh, we're using Amazon or something. Damn, where is it? It's around here somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Subprocessors. Thank you for that. So here they just say, oh, these are our subprocessors, and they don't actually say like, okay, specifically what data is going to which one of these. On the other hand, PayPal takes a very different. Oops. PayPal takes a very different approach. And honestly, I would lean towards this. We're about to release our, our own Aptable privacy statement. We're gonna, we're gonna take a much more detailed approach, but you can see here, like they go through in detail uh, saying, okay, what's the purpose? What data is going with it? Um, you, you probably, if you're a web company and you're processing data uh, on a regular basis, you probably need to keep these records under a different part of GDPR called Article 30 which is the other thing. So internally, you probably need to be keeping these records. And there's a section for controllers and a section for processors. And that is going to look a lot like the PayPal list here, where you have very specific processors and names and geographic locations, a very specific purpose of inventory of what data is disclosed. Do you need to make this list public? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, you know. Will we see more companies do that? Probably. That's my guess, but we'll see. So to uh, go back and answer the question, can that info stay private or internal data mapping? Um, to say specifically, this information in Article 30 can stay private uh, unless somebody, you know, unless you're required to produce it, um, for example, by a DPA or your, you know, your customers might ask you for evidence. Or if you try to hire like an Article 27 representative, they'll probably be like, all right, give me your uh, Article 30 data, you know, usage mapping and inventory. The stuff that needs to be public uh, or needs to be provided to the data subject somehow are in Article 13 and Article 14, and it doesn't cover the same level of detail, no. So I hope that answers that question. All right, uh, three more. We run webinars promoted on social media, inviting folks to sign up via a free web form. We would like to follow up with these guys after the webinar. <laughs> Congratulations, all of you. This is the greatest example because it's the example that we're doing right now. Can we process their details using legitimate interests if we state on the form we have a legitimate interest to use it for this reason? Um, so it's the, the law for this, the relevant law here is um, going to be uh basically assuming that it's it's an email it doesn't explicitly specify this but it, yeah if you're you know if you're collecting email addresses and you want to contact these users again um in the uk which has softer rules around this you'd be able to uh instead of um providing uh, uh, an opt-in or an opt uh, you can provide an opt-out and say hey when you sign up for this webinar we will sign you up for further emails, let us know if you don't want to receive these, check out here, and then every time you email them again, you have to let them opt out. That said, the, the basis, the proper legal basis for this is not legitimate interest, right? Because you're going to be using this basically for uh, uh, communications with them, which may or may not have been solicited. Um, and even if they, so, so this is governed by the e-privacy directive and the, uh, the, uh, all of the, the national legislation. And it's implemented differently in each country. So I would avoid using legitimate interests for that. Um, you're going to have to use consent, most likely. And then you have to deal with the rules around consent. Um, and that's why you, when you guys signed up for this webinar, there's a thing that basically said, you know, we're going to send you emails. Do you consent to this or not? Um, and if you didn't consent to it, you will not receive a follow-up from this. Uh, so there's a bit more. I, I can uh, go into more detail. Uh, whoever asked this question, if you want uh, to talk about this a bit more, again, my, my advice would be the GDPR Slack is a great place to go into more detail. But I can explain this a bit more and give you some references. OK, um, in terms of product design and engineering, are there any specific requirements to how data is handled? Articles 25, which is data protection by design, 30, which is record keeping, and 32, which is uh, data protection, security of processing. Briefly mention some things, but they're also vaguely defined. This is a great, um, a great question because it 
uh, is a question that gets to the landscape of GDPR. So GDPR itself is divided into articles, which are binding, and recitals. The articles themselves are not super helpful. They're basically written to be technology neutral because they don't want to go have to pass GDPR again every time the technology changes. So the recitals have more color commentary and guidance, and there's also official guidance from uh, the Data Protection Directive's uh, Article 29 Working Party, which is becoming and basically being turned into something called the European Data Protection Board, and they're going to continue to issue guidance. There's going to be court decisions about this stuff, although they probably won't be as specific. And there's also guidance, um, let's see, uh, there's also guidance from existing principles. So like, um, this is, th there's some guidance here. This is not super uh, helpful, but like there's some Canadian guidance. Uh, there's some ICO guidance. The, I the ICO is in a, a bit of a different situation because it's not clear whether the UK is actually going to be part of Europe in like six months. Um, but there is some guidance around here, uh, more specific stuff. Again, is it binding guidance? No, not really. But there is more information around this stuff. Um, we have a product design and engineering training course uh, with our company. Uh, if you want more information on this, you can go into more information. Um, or if that's something that people would want, like as another webinar, just let us know. Um, and we'll be happy to throw like a, a product design specific uh, webinar and go into more detail here. But yeah, there are some, there is places for more detail. Unfortunately, none of it's super, super specific. Um, and they're mostly dealt with in terms of principles. Okay, last question. Are pictures with GPS metadata human identifiable if they do not have people in the photo, uh, it depends what the metadata is. So if it's identifying, you know, who took it, uh, you know, GPS coordinates for somebody's house, uh, the answer is it really depends. GDPR is not written in a way where it says specifically, oh, here's the criteria for GPS metadata or any other type of technology. GDPR basically says if there's any way in its subjective, if you know that you can identify this data on its own or in conjunction with other data, then it's personally identifiable. Um, so it really depends, you know, if they do not have people in the photo. There's even, there's actually, I will say that there's actually some, uh, it's not always clear that just pictures of people's faces are identifiable for the purposes of GDPR, unless you can actually like extract that data and take action on it. Um, so just like putting up photos or something might not actually be personal data, but that's a wrinkle. That's not the question you asked. That's, a, that's just like a separate side uh, note. But really, it gets to the question of what is in the metadata. What can you, you know, do you know that you can identify people in the metadata? Um, uh, last question here. Is location data uh, still sensitive uh, if you limit it to high level, country only or country plus state, down to zip, as opposed to like, you know, very specific, like location data or address? Um, again, it depends on would you be comfortable going in front of a regulator and saying this is no longer identifiable? It really depends on the context of the data. Um, so if you're looking at just like how many users do we have from France, I, you know, if that's the if that's the only thing that you're retaining and collecting, uh, that on its own that's not identifiable. Uh, on the other hand, where did you how did you get that data? Where did it come from? Did you discard or destroy? Did you collect other data to get that data and then discard it or destroy it? Um, and you know what are the sort of what rights or what obligations do you have with regard to collecting that data in the first place? Uh, that's that's a kind of a threshold question. But if you get it down to a point where like you really cannot identify an individual, and there's no way that you could, it's probably de-identified and out of scope for GDPR. So okay, um, that is all the questions we have so far. If you have more questions, I know we're uh, quite a bit over time on this, but I hope I've been able to answer everybody's questions. Um, if you have more questions or you want to talk to us, you can feel free to join uh, this free Slack team. Uh, we will get our own privacy policy for this in place before next Friday. Um, but basically, this is only used for answering questions. It's not marketing for us. Uh, it is in the sense that like it's we sponsor it, but it's basically just a free open tool for uh, people to use for questions and answers. And if you want, you can, you can contact me, you know, like hello at apple.com. You can also just feel free to reach out to me. My email address is just chaz at apple.com.
and I'm happy to answer any other questions or uh, get into you know some of the questions that are asked. I need more details to answer um, or to get you in the right direction. So feel free to email me too. Okay, that's it. That's the last slide. It clicks no further. So uh, thank you everybody again. Uh, this is recorded and uh, we'll post the slides unless you opted out. We we'll post the slides and send you an email of the uh, the recording and the transcript and everything. Um, so thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Bye.